Good morning, everyone. I'm Naman Kumar. I'm a robotics lead at Tata Sense, which is an agriculture robotics company based out of Bangalore. And today, as Sumod mentioned, I'll be talking about something which is being used everywhere, from your mobile phones to airplanes. It is being used in software, robotics, finance, marketing, literally any field you can think of. And guess what? It's just a bunch of mathematical equations. It's called a Kalman filter. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. So let's go through a few examples to build some intuition. Let's start with an example of autonomous driving. Autonomous driving has been a hot field for more than 10 years. And today, it's getting more eyeballs than ever. And rightly so. Not only it's an uber cool technology, but more importantly, it's about the safety. A small error made in the decision of the car can lead to a loss of life. And to avoid such accidents, it is of utmost importance to know the position of the car at all times with high precision. For example, knowing if there's a pedestrian in front of a car or if the car is in front of a red light. So for the car to know its state with high precision, we can use a GPS. But the problem with using a GPS is that it's never good enough to rely on just one sensor. For example, GPS doesn't give really good data if there are a lot of tall buildings or in harsh weather conditions. Also, cheap GPS are not accurate enough and have a lot of inherent errors. So a better and a more intuitive way is to use a bunch of sensors and fuse the input coming from them intelligently. So let's talk about a specific case where we have two sensors, IMU, which is an inertial measurement unit, and a GPS. So now we take data from both of them and fuse them. And if we consider a case, let's say the car is driving in a neighborhood where there are a lot of tall buildings, or maybe simply the GPS data stops coming. So in that particular case, nothing will happen. Self-driving car will drive itself using just the IMU. And once we get the GPS data, we'll start incorporating that as well. So how does this work? So that's where the Kalman filter comes into picture. Another example of this in self-driving is obstacle avoidance. So when I was working at Faraday Future, I worked on that specific problem. So we had to predict the state of the people and the vehicles in our self-driving car's vicinity into the future. For example, knowing where the person will be, say, in 10 seconds. So what we did was we came up with a model. For example, we know that a person is, has certain physics. A person walks in a certain way. So using the physics of how a person walk, walks, we came up with a model which basically helped us to predict the state of the pedestrian as well as the car into the future. For example, telling where the person will be, say, in 10 seconds. So at every moment, we had a model, like a physics model, which helped us to predict accurately using past behavior and historical data. So now let's consider a case where we have a bunch of sensors. Because again, relying on just one of them is not a wise choice. So we had LiDAR, cameras, radars, ultrasound sensors. Because if you just have like a camera, for example, Camera doesn't give us the position or velocity of the object. And radar has a really low resolution. So what we did was, we used a bunch of sensors, fused the data smartly, and used the output to track the pedestrian and the cars in the vicinity of the self-driving car. So now we have a model, and we can use that to predict the state. Now, once we get the measurement from these sensors, telling us, OK, this is the exact position of the pedestrian, and this is the position of the car. So we fuse that measurement with our prediction to get a much better estimate of where the car is or where the pedestrian is. So that's how we were using Kalman filter in our own application at Faraday Future. Well, we didn't use a vanilla Kalman filter in its most basic form, but the underlying concept remains the same. So before I move on, I would like to tell that there are two steps to the Kalman filter. The first one is the predict, where we use the systems model and perform prediction into the future. And the second one is measurement, where we use measurements coming in from the sensors and use that to update our state. Now let's consider a simplified example. So let's say we have a robot with a camera C, and it's moving in a one-dimensional space, and there are three doors, door one, two, and three. And let's simplify the problem further. Let's say we, need that we know the initial state of the robot. And our task now is to keep track of the position of the robot similarly to how we had to track the position of the self-driving car in the previous example. So before we move ahead, I would like to tell you about something known as belief. So what does belief mean in this context? Simply put, belief means 
what the algorithm or the robot thinks of its own state. So if you look at this in the first plot, figure A, you can see that it's a Gaussian. It's a simple Gaussian. That means it has a mean and a covariance. Now, the robot starts moving and is in front of door one. And before the robot starts, it's actually pretty confident of its own state. As you can see, the Gaussian is really narrow. That means covariance is less and it's more certain of its own state. Now, the robot starts moving again and is in front of door two. And now, as you can see in figure B, the black Gaussian is wide. That means it's more uncertain of its own state. Why? Because if you think about it, all motions have some uncertainty. There can be motor bias in the robot, there can be wheel slippage because of the surface, and that induces noise in the system. Now, in figure C, the camera on the robot gives a measurement that there's a door, that the robot is in front of door two, shown with the red Gaussian in figure C. So now what we do is, we have this red Gaussian in figure C and the black Gaussian in figure B, which is a prediction. We fuse both of them, we fuse these two Gaussians to come up with a much better estimate of where the robot is shown in the black Gaussian in figure C. So if you look at these three Gaussians, figure B, black Gaussian, figure C, red Gaussian, and then the final black Gaussian in figure C, you can tell that the figure C, black Gaussian, we are more certain of the state of the robot because the Gaussian is really narrow. That means it's more certain, covariance is less. Now again, once the robot starts moving, it becomes more uncertain of its own state because of the motion till it gets a new measurement. So again, to reiterate, Similar to the self-driving case, here we have two, two steps. First one is the predict. Assuming, let's say, the robot is moving at a constant speed. We can predict where the robot will be, say, after five seconds. And then when we get a measurement from the camera on the robot, we use that measurement and fuse that with the prediction to come up with a much better estimate of where the robot is. Now let's talk about a non-robotics example. Let's talk about a project management example, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So let's say you're the project lead and you got assigned a very critical project with a hard deadline. And since you have experience with Agile, you decided to go ahead and set up bi-weekly sprints. Now, before the project starts, you have some idea of how the project is going to go. You can predict when you'll be able to finish the project, depending on the team size, skills they have specific to the project and so on. Now the sprint has started. And remember, at every point of time, you know how the project is going. You have some estimate, depending again on the skills the team member has, number of hours they are putting in, and so on. And you can roughly predict how much project you'll be able to finish at the end of sprint one. Now the sprint one has ended. And you get a bunch of data, like Jira tasks you finished, how many unit tests did you pass, what is the integration testing status, and the code coverage. So these measurements are exactly similar to the measurements in the previous case, like the presence of a door or the measurement we get from the GPS sensor. So now you have, the, you have these measurements and you already have a prediction of what you thought, how much project you will be able to finish at the end of sprint one. Now you fuse both of them. You fuse your measurements, this, 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 this input with the prediction you had. And this helps you come up with a much more precise estimate of the project. So, Calvin filter, in the case of project management, gives us an ability to predict accurately if and when we will meet the milestone. So that's how you can use Calvin filter in a project management example. But I would like to clarify a couple of things here. This is a very minimalistic example. And I brought this example up just to build some intuition. The problem here is the inability to come up with a good model for such a short project. 10 sprints are just not enough. We have 10 sprints, and that means we only have 10 measurement updates, which is just not enough. Ideally, we would like a longer project or more measurement updates. But at least hope these three examples build some intuition, and now let's move on. Now, before we move on, I, I would like to talk about what we are doing at Tartan Sense and how Kalman filter is really useful for our own application. So Tartan Sense is an agriculture robotics company based out of Indranagar in Bangalore. And we are trying to solve the weeding problem in cotton farms. So our job is to kill all the weeds in the cotton farms automatically without killing any cotton. And for that, the state estimation or the Kalman filter for navigation becomes all the more important because we need to know the position of the robot with high precision at all times in the field. Why? Because if we know the position of the robot, that means we know when the robot is on top of a weed. And then we can switch on the sprayer, spray the chemical and kill the weed. 
And that's why Kalman filter or state estimation is really, really important for our own application. And any minor error in tracking the position of the robot might result in not killing of weed, or worse, killing of cotton. And to tackle this problem, again, we have a bunch of sensors, like IMU, encoders, and so on. Because relying on just IMU is not a wise choice, because it accumulates a lot of drift as you go on. And same, if we have wheel encoders, it gives bad data if there's a lot of slippage. So we take data, both from IMU and wheel encoders, fuse that, again, using a Kalman filter, to come up with a much better estimate of where the robot is. So how this works is, the robot is in the field, it's going around, it's killing weed, and we have a Kalman filter running, which tracks the position of the robot by predicting the state into the future, and then updating that state by using the measurement coming from IMU and encoders. Now, once we know the state of the robot, and we have a camera, as you can see on the right side, uh, at the boom. So we use that camera to detect weed using a deep learning technique. And that algorithm sends us the position of the weed to the state estimate algorithm. Now, once the state estimation algorithm has the position of the weed, we track the position of the robot, and once the robot is on top of a weed, we switch on the spray and spray the chemical and kill the weed. So that's how we are using Kalman filter for our own application. So what I discussed now is shown here in this diagram. So this camera basically tracks the position and tracks the weed and detects the weed using, using a deep learning algorithm. And then we have a Kalman filter, which tracks the position of the robot and tells us, okay, the sprayer is now is on top of a weed. And then we switch on the sprayer, spray the chemical and kill the weed. Before we go to Kalman filter, let's talk about base filter. And let's continue with a previous example. So let's say a tartan sense weeding robot is in the field and its initial state or its initial position, say x, y, is x0. And then let's assume that our robot is moving at constant speed. Let's call that u1. Now, we know where the robot is right now and we know its average speed. So it's very easy to predict where the robot will be, say, in 5 seconds or 10 seconds. Let's call that x1 dash. And that's our prediction. Now we get a new set of measurements from IMU and encoders. Let's call that Z1. Now, we have a prediction and we have our measurements. And we fuse both of them using some maths, which we'll get to soon. And we fuse both of them to get an updated state estimate X1, which tells the state of the robot with higher precision, more accuracy. And this X1 becomes your input for the next iteration. So, for example, your prediction can be, okay, the robot is at 10,2 at the end of 30 seconds. And then after you incorporate the measurements, you get a much more accurate state estimate. And let's call x1 be 9.8, 2.1 at the end of 30 seconds. And this x1 becomes your input for the next iteration. And the process repeats till the robot is in the field. So basically, what base filter does is it helps us estimate a probability density function using a series of measurements and some maths recursively over time. Before we go into the equations, Let's go through this block diagram. So to reiterate, we know base filter or Kalman filter has two main steps, predict and update. One of the inputs to the predict is the control, which in a previous case was the average speed of the robot. And the other input is basically the belief from the previous time step, bell xt minus one. Now prediction step, it, using the dynamic model of the system, predicts the state into the future, and let's call that bell dash xt. Now, that bell dash xt becomes input to the update function. And along with that input, update also takes in the measurements, which was IMU and encoders in our previous example. Now, we fuse that prediction with the measurement in the update step, and finally output the more state est accurate state estimate. That becomes the input to the predict step, and the cycle repeats. Yes. So, sorry, so the, just to clear, the robot is never traveling at a constant speed. It's physically not possible for a robot to travel at a constant speed, especially in a farm condition, because the surface is like really rough. And even if you say give a constant velocity to the robot, say 0.3 meters per second, 
never it happens that it goes at 0.3 meters per second. That's why we have like encoders and other sensors which actually tells us at what speed the robot is going at. Again, so as I mentioned earlier, that can be because of like wheel slippage, if like a wheel is slipping, or they can be like motor bias or, or issues like that. Uh, so now coming to these equations, so if you look at that, bell dash xt is exactly similar to x1 dash in this case. And bell xt is exactly similar to x1 in this case. So this is just a mathematical representation of what we have been discussing till now. Everything else remains the same. So if you look at the first equation, what we're trying to do here is we incorporate the control ut, which in our case is the average speed of the robot into our current state of the robot, which is xt minus one. And we find the probability that when the robot, which, whose current state is xt minus one, goes at the average speed of ut, it reaches the state xt. So basically, what is the probability of reaching xt given your control and your current state? And we simply multiply that with the, prediction, with the output from the previous step. And this was 10,2 at the end of 30 seconds in our previous example. Now, you use this prediction and you multiply that with the measurement you should get at the state xt. So basically, the first term in the second equation is what is the probability that the robot will observe a certain measurement when it, it is at state xt? And you multiply both of them to get a more accurate state estimate, which in our previous case was 9.8, 2.1. Now this becomes your input for the next step and the loop continues. So we have been talking about Bayes filter and we went through a few examples, but what exactly is a Kalman filter? So if you know what, what is a Bayes filter, Kalman filter is exactly like a Bayes filter with just two conditions. The first one is all the variables we discussed till now have to be normally distributed and the noise we have has to be Gaussian. The second assumption is, or the second condition is that it only works for linear systems. For example, it won't work for cases where variables have sign or cost relation among themselves. We'll get to the nonlinear case later, but Kalman filter only considers linear systems. And again, to reiterate, Kalman filter has two main steps. The first one is predict, where you use the system model and predict the state into the future along with some uncertainty. And the second step is the update step. So once you have the prediction and you get the measurement, you fuse both of them to get a much better estimate of the state of the robot. So one important thing to notice here is that once we have the measurement, Kalman filter figures out using a bunch of maths what estimates should be given more importance and what estimates should be given less importance. Should we give more importance to our prediction or should we give more importance to our measurement? So this is what Kalman filter is. And as mentioned, it has two main steps, update and predict. And we start this process with some initialization. So we initialize the system state and its corresponding uncertainty. So to initialize, we can use our best educated guess, use some historical data or past behavior. It doesn't have to be super accurate. And since we haven't got any measurement yet, so there is no update step and there is no output. So in the first iteration, the initialization directly goes to the prediction step. And in the prediction step, we use the dynamic model of the system and predict the state into the future along with its estimate uncertainty. Now this becomes the input to the update step. And once we get the measurement, meaning we have the measurement data and some uncertainty associated with it, uh, and we can find measurement uncertainty using data or it's generally provided by the equipment manu manufacturer. Now using the measurement uncertainty along with the state estimate uncertainty from the previous prediction time step, we find Kalman gain. And Kalman gain is the key to tell us which should we give more importance to measurement or should we give more importance to prediction? Now, once we have the Kalman gain, we use that to estimate our current state and its corresponding uncertainty. Now, this is the output of the Kalman filter, which you can take and use. And it's then also fed to the prediction step and the cycle repeats. Now, let's dig deeper. I know there's a lot going on in this equation, in this slide, but let's walk through an example. So let's say that we have a tartan sense robot and its current state or position, like x, y, it's x, t minus one. And we know that it's a linear system because Kalman filter only works for linear systems. 
So let's assume that our tartan sense robot is only moving linearly for now. And we'll get to the nonlinear case later. So what Kalman filter does is it helps us estimate the state of the robot. It helps us model the linear system along with the noise in the system. And it combines both of them and it helps us to keep track of the noise in each of the input parameters. Now, we know that it only works for linear systems. So that means our predicted state, xt, will be a linear combination of our current state, xt minus 1, and the control ut. So basically, when we apply, say, average speed to the robot who's at xt minus 1, we'll reach xt. And all systems, all processes have some noise. So we have added some Gaussian noise. And a and b depends on the system. So for example, if we are assuming a constant velocity model that our robot is always going at constant velocity, we can use equations of motion and come up with A and B. And same goes for the measurement. So ZT is the measurement which the robot ideally should observe when it says state XT. And again, some Gaussian noise is added. Here, CT also depends on the system and it's basically a matrix which transforms state space, state space XT, into measurement space ZT. XT is basically the state of the robot and ZT is basically the measurement we are getting. And and it only, it's only true for linear systems. Now, we all know that uh, these variables are represented by a Gaussian. That means it has a mean and a covariance, which means to find xt, we have to find mean and covariance. And that's what we are doing in the first two equations in the Calvin filter algorithm shown in red. So to find xt, we have to find mean and covariance. And we split the equation one, which is xt equal to at xt minus one plus bt ut into two equations. One equation we find mu, and other equation we find sigma. So the equation for mu is exactly the same as xt. It's just xt has been replaced by mu. And this is our predicted mean. And for a predicted covariance, it's a function of the covariance from the previous time step. And some Gaussian noise is added. So this mu and sigma, shown in red, is a predicted state. Now, before we move ahead, let's go back to a robot. And we know that its, its state is xt minus 1. And that is shown with the red Gaussian in figure one. And now we get a set of measurements from IMU and encoders. And let's say that's shown by the blue Gaussian in the second plot. Now, our task is to fuse both of these Gaussians, meaning to fuse a prediction shown in red with the measurement shown in blue. So how do we do that? So that's where the Kalman gain comes into picture. So what exactly is a Kalman gain? Kalman gain, simply put, is error in prediction divided by error in prediction plus error in measurement. It's quite intuitive if you think about it. So if error in measurement is really high, that means our predicted state estimate is more reliable than the measurement, meaning that k will be close to zero. And we'll just use our prediction as our current state. But on the other hand, if the error in measurement is really low, that means measurements are more reliable than our prediction, and k will be close to one. Now, once we have the Kalman gain, we use that to find our current state which is mu t and sigma t. So we use Kalman gain and come up with a new updated state shown with the orange Gaussian in figure three. Now, as you can see, the orange Gaussian is much narrower. That means it has less covariance. That means we are more certain of the state of the robot after the fusion. And again, after we fuse, we are more confident, okay, this is the state of the robot. And once we have that, the process repeats itself. So this is what a Kalman filter looks like. And before we move ahead, let's talk about a very specific example. Let's say that state estimate uncertainty, which we discussed here in the red, which says estimate uncertainty, let's say that that's 400. And the measurement uncertainty for the IMU is 144. And the measurement uncertainty for the encoders is 36. In reality, it's a metrics, but let's say it's a simple number just, just for discussion. Now, a state estimation or prediction says that the robot has actually moved two meters. Then the IMU comes in, no, IMU says the robot has actually moved 1.2 meters. So whom do we trust? How should we fuse this? So that's where the uncertainty comes into picture. And we know that IMU uncertainty is 144, which is much less than the state estimate uncertainty of 400. So we give more importance to the IMU data, and let's say our updated state estimate is 1.3 meters. And same goes in the case where we have encoders. And we rely the most trust on the encoders because it has a least uncertainty of 36. So we need to keep one thing in mind here is that 
After the Kalman gain calculation, we update all these uncertainties and use those uncertainties in the next iteration. So this is it. So this is what a Kalman filter looks like. As I'm sure you can already tell that there are a few shortcomings of this Kalman filter, which we already discussed earlier. So it only works if the variables are normally distributed and the noise is Gaussian. Well, that might be okay for a lot of cases, but still there are a lot of cases where that will fail. And we'll get to that soon. But a bigger assumption is about linearity. Linearity rarely exists in real life. So if you take a simple example of say you're driving home, you'll keep on driving at a constant velocity till you see a car in front of you. And you got this measurement and you use this measurement to update your velocity to avoid a collision. So let's say you deaccelerate and reduce your speed. So it's this deacceleration which induces non-linearity in the, in the system. And you can no longer use Kalman filter. So what do we do? So that's where we have extended Kalman filter. If you remember, in Kalman filter, a predicted state is a linear combination of our current state and the control. In extended Kalman filter, our predicted state becomes a non-linear combination of our current state and control. And let's call that function g. And similarly for the measurement, let's call that function h. Now, that's good. Now we have two nonlinear functions, but it actually has a few problems. So the first one being that the belief is no longer Gaussian. Because if you think, if you pass a Gaussian to a nonlinear function, the output doesn't remain a Gaussian anymore. And that can actually be a huge problem for us. Because all the equations we had were based on the assumption that the belief is a Gaussian. And those equations won't be valid anymore. So what's the solution? Well, as simple or stupid it may seem, we simply linearize the function using Taylor expansion. So we linearize our nonlinear function around the mean using this Taylor expansion. I know there are a few issues with the Taylor expansion and we'll get to that, but at least for now, we have a linearized function for further processing and everything else remains the same. Don't worry too much about the algorithm here. It's exactly the same as we discussed earlier. It's just linearity has been replaced by its nonlinear counterparts. Okay, that's good. So now we solved the nonlinearity problem and our system will work for nonlinear cases. But can you think of a case where even this will fail? So talking about where extended Kalman filter can fail, let's go back to our original example. So if you remember, in this particular example, we knew the initial state of the robot and the robot was moving in a one-dimensional corridor with three doors and doors were marked one, two, and three. But let's talk about a more real life scenario. Let's say we don't know the initial state of the robot and doors are not marked one, two, and three. And we have the same task of keeping track of the state of the robot. Now the robot starts moving and it is in front of a door. And camera sends a measurement that there's actually a door here. But since there are no markings on the door, we are not exactly sure which door it is. So the probability of the measurement is basically shown by three Gaussians next to the position of those three doors. Basically, it can be any of those doors. And similarly, it goes for the belief of the state. The robot can be in front of any of those three doors. Now, the robot starts moving again and again. It becomes more uncertain of its own state because of the motion, as you can see with the Gaussian. Now, it gets a new measurement that there's a door present. Again, for the probability of the measurement, it can be in front of any of the three doors. And what we do now is we fuse this measurement probability with the state estimate from the previous plot to figure out where exactly the robot is. And as you can see in the second last plot, it actually has five Gaussians. And each one of them has some probability of the robot being there. But clearly, one of them is much more probable than the others because the Gaussian is really, really narrow. That means it has less covariance and it has more, it's more certain of the state of the robot. Now, so without knowing the initial state of the robot, we are able to localize the robot. Now the robot starts moving again and it becomes more and more uncertain of its own state till it gets a new measurement. So clearly, extended Kalman filter won't work here. Because, as we discussed, extended Kalman filter only works for Gaussian. And it only works for unimodal Gaussians. But here, we have multimodal Gaussians. So there are other algorithms which we will touch upon in the coming slides, like particle filters, histogram filters, some of Gaussians. Uh, but extended Kalman filter will not work here at all. So talking about where else will extended Kalman filter fail. So if you guys are a little familiar with Taylor expansion, you will know that Taylor expansion does a really bad job in linearizing a highly nonlinear function. 
and our estimates will be pretty bad. And the same goes if it's a really wide Gaussian. That means the degree of uncertainty is really high. Is there a better way to linearize? There is. So that's where we have unscented Kalman filter. So simply put in one line, what unscented Kalman filter does is, it takes a bunch of points compared to just one point in the extended Kalman filter where we just took the mean and linearized the function around the mean. Here we take a bunch of points called sigma points. We pass those points through a nonlinear function and get a non-Gaussian output. And then we simply find the best approximate Gaussian fit. Now, since our belief is a Gaussian, everything more or less remains the same. So one thing which you can remember to decide which Kalman filter to use in which situation. So if it's a linear system, use Kalman filter. If there's minor non-linearity in the system, use extended Kalman filter. If it's a highly non-linear system, I'll suggest you give unscented Kalman filter a shot. So I would like to end this by giving you a glimpse of an alternative series of algorithms. It's called non-parametric filters. So till now we were discussing Gaussian filters or parametric filters because they had an assumption of Gaussians. But these non-parametric filters have no such assumption. And two of the most common ones are histogram filters and particle filters. And both of them work really well in the robot scenario where EKF failed. In the histogram filters, the belief is represented by a histogram. And in the case of particle filters, we use a bunch of weighted particles. So if you would like to discuss any of these algorithms, please let me know and I'll be happy to do that. I hope it was at least a little useful and you got something out of it. And if you would like to discuss how you can use any of these algorithms in your own project, please let me know and thank you. Any questions? Yes. So uh, the application of extended Kalman filter? In the pro yes. So basically, ideally what happens, the problem here is, it's similar to deep learning, like if you have a very less data, you cannot do much, right? So here what we want is, either it's a really long project, where you have a lot of sprints going on, and you get a lot of measurement updates, like a lot of these information, or you have like a hierarchical project, where you can, disc where you can take inputs from different projects and come up with a better estimate. So coming up for something like this for a very small project, because there are no measurement updates. So you're just predicting, predicting, but you're not able to improve your state estimate. You're not able to reduce your uncertainty. So ideally, this is, project management is a better suited for a case where we have a longer project going on or more measurement updates. We can discuss this in detail after, after the presentation also. Yes. Yeah. So your case of robotics here. So one approach is like take look at it very mathematically, uh, the, the Kalman filter and everything. The other one is like we can look at the physics of motion. Yes. The physics of motors. Uh, so there, you can have a physics model or one can have a Kalman model where you forget about the physics, you just put those matrices or whatever and make a prediction. Which one you found working really good? Yeah, so basically as I discussed, uh, Kalman filter actually uses some physics model inside it. For example, if, you, if the robot is going at a constant velocity, then you have to use physics, like some basic equations of motion to predict where the robot will be, say, after 10 seconds. So that's where the physics comes into the Kalman filter itself. So I think that's like the right combination because to model any system, or like to model the motion of a vehicle, you need physics. And you use that inside a Kalman filter to be better predict and estimate the state. So it's ideally like a combination of both of them. Um, hi there. Um, hi. Re really cool talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a quick question about um, generally the, the mapping of your farm, I guess. D do you do this in a one-shot kind of scheme where you just assume no map to begin with or you have, you, you map it once and then when you rerun the robot in your... So we have no sense? map. So, and we don't actually need a map also because it's, everything is happening in a relative term locally. We keep track of the state of the robot and when our deep learning algorithm tells that this is the position of the weed. We keep track of the state of the robot and we know when the robot is on top of a weed, we switch on the sprayer and kill the weed. So everything is happening in relative terms. So we don't need like an absolute map. 
for this application. Yes. Hi. So this is regarding the application of uh, the uh, Kalman filter in agriculture. So this is more around the uncertainty of the agricultural field. Like if in the nth moment a bird, let's say a bird flies down, and so the, the, the camera did not, we have such scenarios happened where the camera did not detect. So that, so a uh, camera won't detect the weed or there'll be a problem with the state estimation? Uh, as in, uh, it might collide with the bird or any, any, any uh, uncertainty, uncertain object that comes in contact. So we haven't faced that problem till now because one of the reasons being camera is pointing, pointing downwards. It's like a meter from the surface and it's like a moving machine. So ideally birds and other animals will try to stay away from it. Uh, there is a system of uh, error you have, right? And uh, that is what uh, you are handling. At what point this breaks? For example, this vehicle is say, moving in 300 kilometer, non-agricultural use case. Can you repeat the last line, please? Non-agricultural use case. Suppose the vehicle is moving in, say, 300 kilometer per hour. So there is a registration error, right? So at what point um, Kalman filter fails? So the problem, like if a vehicle is moving at such a fast speed, what we have to do is the processing has to be really, really fast. Uh, we need to get data from all the sensors at a really high FPS and do the fusion at a really high FPS. So that's one of the challenges if the vehicle is moving at a, like a really fast speed. Because everything, all processing has to be really fast. So if I take an example of self-driving, and let's say it's moving at like 80 kilometers per hour, which is very different from our agriculture robot, which is like few meters per second. So in that particular case, we need to have cameras and have like a long vision. We should be able to see far ahead in the future or in the front of the car or the robot so that we can use that information to like basically come up with a better estimate. So for example, as I mentioned, if, we, if there's a pedestrian far away, but the car is moving at 100 kilometers per hour, we need to know the pedestrian and its state and we should be able to predict where the pedestrian will be, say in 10 seconds, so that we can maneuver the car accordingly. But if you get that information like in the last second, like we can't do anything. So I think it's all about like, being able to see far into the future and being able to predict more accurately if like for high speed applications. Just a follow up question on that. So what kind of computation power we are talking here? So uh, right now we are simply like testing for, so this particular doesn't require a lot of computation. Like the Kalman filter inherently doesn't require a lot of computation. Uh, but it, for example, it's right now we are like bottlenecked by the deep learning, deep learning application, which requires a lot of computation. Uh, but Kalman filter inherently doesn't require a lot of computation, but uh, for example, if you have a camera and you need to get some data from the camera, that's where the computation comes in. Running these equations and running the Kalman filter actually doesn't require a lot of computation, but how you feed that data to the Kalman filter, how you get data from the camera, LiDAR, GPS, that's where all the computation comes in, not like in the, app, in the implementation of the Kalman filter. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hello? So uh, my question is, uh, there are two applications that I see. One is uh, when the when your object is actually moving, like when a human being is moving, and another is when the weed is stationary. So my question is, when should you apply it? When the object is moving or when it's stationary? Because I mean, uh, I don't know much about it, but uh, what I feel is, if it is uh, dynamic, then you should be more keen in applying something like a Kalman filter. So in, <coughs> sorry. Rather than it being stationary. So in the case of weed also, yes, the weed is not moving, but our robot is moving. And that's why we are using the Kalman filter to basically track the position of the robot. And robot is continuously moving. And yes, weed is stationary. And weed is like a secondary thing. But for us, the robot is moving. And to be able to know when the robot is on top of the weed, we have to apply Kalman filter. Because we need to track the position of the robot. I mean to tell when the robot is on top of a weed. Weed can be anything. It can be a cotton plant also. That's secondary. But the primary thing is to be able to track and know where the robot is with high precision. Yeah.
So like in both the cases, even for example, if there's a robot, let's say, let's say we get a data from IMU encoders at what, 10 hertz? Uh, or maybe like one hertz, let's take like the worst case and we're getting the data from IMU encoders at one hertz. But we still have to predict how the robot behaves before in between we get the data, right? And so that's where we need to use Calvin filter even for the robot because the frequency at which we get data is not like thousand hertz or megahertz, especially for like IMU and encoders. We get like at a lower hertz, like 10 hertz, 100 hertz, but we still need the ability using the physics of the robot to see, okay, where will the robot be? Where will the robo robot be after some time? And same goes for the case of pedestrian. For example, in the case of a person, we have some physics, we know something, okay, a person's average speed is this. And we using that information and also using, if we are continuously tracking a person, how that person is move, has moved in the last five minutes or five seconds. And using that information will help us know, okay, the person will be there in say 10 seconds, 20 seconds. And if we have a car going at say 100 kilometers per hour, Ideally, we would include that information and try to maneuver around the person. So I think it's applicable in both the cases to improve, improve the state estimate. Yes. Hi. So uh, I want to know like how accurate this is, like when the weed is on the crop itself, what portion of the crop also gets destroyed? So yeah, so that's one of the challenges we are also trying to figure out right now because the problem is not with the state estimation. State estimation can actually be decently accurate, like up to a few centimeters. Uh, but a bigger problem for us is to detecting the weed when it's near a cotton. So basically, if we have a top-facing camera and this cotton, and weed is actually under the cotton, you cannot actually see the weed. So that's a bigger problem actually for us right now than state estimation. So there are other options like detecting weed from the side, because after say a few days when the cotton plant grows tall, you cannot actually see the weed from the top view. And that's actually a bigger problem. State estimation, since we are doing everything r relatively, like locally, it's much less problem for us than like actually detecting the weed using like deep learning. But the, when the weed is on, on top of the crop, like what portion of the crop gets destroyed when you spray? So when that happens, we don't spray on it because our higher priority is not killing of cotton. Then our second priority is killing of weed. So if there's a weed very close to the cotton, we simply don't kill the weed because we don't want to damage the crop. 